here, including several thousand school children and several hundred members of the print and broadcast press corps. And we'd like to thank each one of you for being here. In just a moment, senior representatives of each of the three branches of government will make their ceremonial entrances. Article 1, Section 1 of the Constitution, all legislative powers herein granted shall be vested in a Congress of Reverend Richard C. Halverson and Reverend James David Ford. Let us pray. God of our Father, Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. Gentlemen, boys and girls, this is... I'm Ted Koppel. Welcome to a celebration of citizenship. Over the last 10 years, Americans have been doing a lot of celebrating. We've had national parties for the Declaration of Independence and the Statue of Liberty, as well as for the Olympic Games. But today, here in Washington, there are no tall ships on the Potomac, no massive displays of flags, no spectacular fireworks. And for a good reason. The men and women and boys and girls gathered here and in homes, factories, offices and classrooms across the nation have assembled not merely to celebrate the Constitution. They've come to start something, to begin a national effort that requires dedication as well as celebration. On this day 200 years ago, the ink on the Constitution was still wet and there was considerable doubt that the Constitution would ever be approved by the then imperfect Union of States. Every word, every phrase, every sentence of every paragraph was examined by the delegates as if their lives depended on it, because their lives did depend on it. And that's as true now as it was then. But for 200 years it has worked so well that most of us now take it for granted. And that's what this celebration of citizenship is all about. We're here today not simply to honor the Constitution, but to renew our understanding and appreciation of it. I am honored to introduce your mistress of ceremonies, Dr. Floretta McKenzie. Dr. McKenzie. Thank you, Ted. And welcome again, everybody. This is a star-spangled celebration, but this time, the fireworks are not on the outside. They are inside the Constitution. The Constitution doesn't make a gift of liberty. It assumes that we, the people, were meant to be free and are determined to remain free, and that we accept the responsibilities that freedom demands. Miss Alison Porter and the United States Army Band. This is my country, land of my birth. This is my country, grand is honor. 
Thank you, Dr. McKenzie. Mr. President, Senator Byrd, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Chief Justice. 200 years ago today, and for a good many years before that, our 13 states were in turmoil. There was almost no domestic tranquility. There were conflicts between the states over commercial matters. There were conflicts between the states over boundaries. Virginia and Maryland, right near where we are today, had a serious quarrel over boundaries and navigation on the Chesapeake Bay and on the Potomac River. There had been a rebellion in Massachusetts that history knows as Shays Rebellion, and it was put down by troops of the Massachusetts military. What happened after we won the revolution is what has happened to every victorious alliance in world history. The victorious allies began to fall out. George Washington, in retirement down at Mount Vernon, despaired over the idea of Americans in conflict with other Americans. Washington, Madison, Hamilton, Franklin, and others were sure that we could never prosper and that we could never have security, real security, without a new form of government that would be stronger than the government that was provided by the Articles of Confederation. Here is what they did about it. And I will read to you what they wrote in the preamble of the Constitution, and I am reading from the official pocket-sized copy, the Bicentennial Commission's official copy. Here is what they said. We, the people, we, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our prosperity, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. This, fellow Americans, is what we celebrate today.
That was Holly Robinson. From our experience, we know that when one branch of the government gets too much power, usually America gets hurt as a result. Even the Congress is divided. Every state has two senators, but big states have more members in the House of Representatives than do the states with smaller population. It is a compromise that works. And this is what we do in the Congress. We compromise. We look for positive solutions that work for all Americans. Above all, the Constitution is a document of political expansion and liberty, an umbrella of rights protecting... assigned to the judicial branch the authority to interpret the Constitution. They wrote, the judicial power of the United States shall be vested in one Supreme Court. Ladies and gentlemen, the Chief Justice of the United States. Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, the framers of our Constitution wanted to make sure that the government they established was very different from that which they as colonists had experienced under King George III of England. They hit upon the idea of separating the powers of government into legislative, executive, and judicial and assigning each of those powers to a separate branch of the newly created federal government. Each of those branches is represented here today. The Congress has the power to make laws, the President has the power to carry out the laws, and the Supreme Court and other courts have the power to decide cases arising under those laws. The reason that the framers did this was their desire that these three separate branches would check and balance one another and thus prevent the government from becoming too powerful. Under this kind of system, it sometimes takes longer for the government to do something because Congress and the President may not agree with one another or because the courts may decide that a law is unconstitutional. But this very sort of friction is itself a guarantee against arbitrary or ill-considered actions by the government. Separation of powers is as important now as it was 200 years ago. Thank you, Chief Justice Rehnquist. The Constitution as a... The Constitution doesn't work just because of the words. It works because we believe it. It works because we make it work. We make it work by caring by voting and by proving over and over again that the real power of the Constitution is us, we the people. Since Article II of the Constitution was written, there have been 40 presidents. It is a privilege for me to introduce the 40th President of the United States. When George Washington was elected as the first president of the United States, the total population of the country was nearly four million. Today, there are over five million federal employees. Times have changed. But the basic premise of the Constitution hasn't changed. It's still our blueprint for freedom. One of our more able statesmen and constitutional lawyers 
Daniel Webster once wrote, We may be tossed upon an ocean where we can see no land, nor perhaps the sun or stars, but there is a chart and a compass for us to study, to consult, and obey. The chart is the Constitution. Two hundred years ago, the very notion of free self-government was a new idea. But James Madison, a man who many call the father of the Constitution, urged his fellow citizens not to oppose the idea simply because it was new. He argued that it was the glory of the American people, that they were not blindly bound to the past, but were willing to rely on their own good sense and experience in charting the future. It's interesting that Madison and others had to defend the Constitution because it was new. Times have changed. For over 200 years, we've lived with freedom under law, and perhaps we've become complacent about it. We should never forget how rare and precious freedom is. Active and informed citizens are vital to the effective functioning of our constitutional system. All of us have an obligation to study the Constitution and participate actively in the system of self-government that it establishes. This is an obligation we owe not only to ourselves, but to our children and their children. And there is no better time than right now, during the next four years of the Bicentennial, to rededicate ourselves to the constitutions and values it contains. Let us never forget that the signers of the Declaration of Independence acted with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence. One hundred years ago, on the occasion of the centennial of the Constitution, another president, Grover Cleveland, accepted the privilege that I have been given here today to honor the Constitution, and his words are as true now as they were then. He said, when we look down upon a hundred years and see the origin of our Constitution, when we contemplate all its trials and triumphs, when we realize how completely the principles upon which it is based have met every national need and national peril, how devoutly should we say with Franklin, God governs in the affairs of men. And now, Stephanie, Damien, Brian, Thais, would you join me and everybody here and everybody watching and listening throughout the land as we recite the words that we all know by heart, the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. As I said earlier, the ceremony here today wasn't meant to be a birthday party. It was meant to start something, a national reaffirmation of the Constitution that will go on for the next four years. It's a far-reaching plan, what former Chief Justice Berger calls a national history and civics lesson for all of us. But what it really is, I think, is an invitation to all of us to get involved. As young Damien Atkins said earlier, the Constitution doesn't work because of the words. It works because we have made it work. Over and over today, in one way or another, we've been asked to get involved. But how can we begin? What can we do right now? You would think there would be an easy answer to those questions. There isn't. Each of us must find an answer. Of course we should read the Constitution. 
Of course, we should vote in every election. But what else? We, the people, must ask ourselves, how can we improve our homes, our work, our schools, our communities, and our neighborhoods, and then do something about it? In short, get involved, volunteer. The people who wrote the Constitution did, and look what they accomplished. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Wayne Newton and join him and the 300 voice choir from 13 Washington area choral groups in singing God Bless America. God bless America, land that I own. Stand beside her and guide her through the night with the light from above. From the mountains to the prairies to the oceans, white with foam.